Welcome to our Bible study. I hope and I pray that God will speak to you and indeed speak to me as we look at our theme today. Let's pray to that end right now, shall we? Let's believe that the Spirit of God will touch our hearts and move in our lives and from the Word of God do something that is eternal and eternally worthwhile. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your mighty word, wonderful scriptures that open to us by the Holy Spirit, transform our thinking and just do wonders in our lives. We want to be people that are relevant to our generation. We want to be knowing the times and knowing the seasons. And so we pray that as we just look into the scriptures today, that our hearts will be enlarged our will will be fortified and that our gaze will be heavenward and that we will have an eye for what the Spirit wants us to know and understand. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm reminded of uh, that wonderful saying that it's uh, attributed to C.T. Studd. Only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And if ever there was a man that at any time personified what he spoke and that uh, phrase that he uh, was able to construct and share with people, uh, it was C.T. Studd. The story is told that um, F.B. Meyer, the great Bible teacher, and C.T. Studd were sharing a room at, I think, the Keswick Convention up there in the Lakes District of England. Now, that would have been well over 100 years ago or approximately that. Anyway, they were sharing a room, both ministering at the convention. And about 4.30, 5 o'clock, F.B. Meyer turned in his bed and looked across the room and there, under a flickering candle, was the bowed figure of C.T. Studd. And C.T. Studd was peering at the Bible and he had a little notebook and a little pen in his hand. And F.B. Meyer said, uh, Charlie, what are you doing? Well, he said, uh, what I'm doing, he said, is I'm going through the Gospels in the light of what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. And he said, I've been going through all the commandments of Jesus in the Gospels. And he said, I'm ticking off those very few that I've, by his grace, been enabled to fulfill and obey. And he said, I'm putting a, a dash and a cross beside those that I've yet to obey. What a man, what a heart. And yet that kind of heart is to be replicated in your heart and in mine, especially in these days when Jesus' words are very, very apt today. Work for the night is coming. The night comes when no man will work. I've entitled our study today, and I don't know how far we'll get into it, but we're going to try, called The Clash of the Three Kingdoms. A clash of the three kingdoms. Well, we've got to determine what those kingdoms are and why they would be on a collision course and why they'll ultimately and definitely clash coming together in opposition to each other. But first we're going to look at a very wonderful scripture found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. And I hope you've also got uh, uh, a notebook to put just down the scriptures. Don't write everything that I say, um, but every scripture reference so that you can go back later and have a look. This is a, a wonderful parable that Jesus told, and it's applicable to our study. 
Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not to faint or give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice though so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and swiftly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Tremendous principles there. Now, the judge isn't typical of God. God is not resistant to the cry of his people. But God is waiting for times and for hard attitudes to be in line. Now we see most of all the highlight and the focus is on the persistency of that widow who cried out to the judge time, time and time again. The persistent, the, the importunity of asking and keep on asking. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 11, we have the pattern prayer that Jesus gave. Our Father, who art in heaven, and so on. Now, in that passage of Scripture, we have also the wonderful declaration of Jesus. And he says these words, Ask, and the Greek talks about it being in present continuous sense. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Why do you think, in the light of the return of the Lord, are we admonished very firmly and lovingly and strongly by Jesus to ask and keep on asking? to seek and keep on seeking, to knock and keep resolutely knocking, praying without ceasing and not fainting or not giving in. Why do you think? Well, I think it's very uh, obvious from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, Jesus said, because evil will wax worse and worse, the love of many, that is, righteous people, Godly people, even true Christians, the love of many will wax cold and they will be part of the falling away that the Bible talks about. You know what you're like when you're under perpetual pressure and stress? You find yourself getting weary in well-doing. Even though the admonishment is not to be weary in well-doing, nonetheless we're human and after a period of uh, prolonged pressure, we are a little bit in tendency to say, well, what's the use? Nothing's happening. But this parable is very powerful because it admonishes us, irrespective of our feeling or the outer circumstances, that we are to pray without ceasing, to pray and continually pray and not to give in. Let's talk about the three kingdoms. The three kingdoms are opposed to one another. The first lot of kingdoms are the kingdoms of this world. 
The second is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of his dear son and of heaven. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of his dear son as one. And the last one, uh, but certainly not least in activity, is the kingdom of darkness. Now, all of these are opposed to one another. The kingdoms of this world. We'll talk about each of those in a few moments. I want to turn to Isaiah, that great gospel prophet, as someone has called him. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, his prophecies are fragmentary, uh, not so cohesive and uh, so uh, together um, as Ezekiel or even Jeremiah. So we have here in chapter 2 a remarkable set of promises, and it's regarding the end time. That is said very, very clearly. This is what Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Then he says these words, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What a tremendous, graphic, exciting prospect that awaits the kingdom of God when we find the kingdoms of the nations or the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of the Lord Christ. That's read, uh, we read that in Revelation chapter 11. We'll go there later. And then we have Isaiah chapter 11. And it speaks similarly about this great day. It talks about how there will be out of the stump of Jesse a branch that will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, that's the Spirit of God, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest, and they will neither harm 
nor destroy on my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, the lower Egypt, from upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. And so it goes on and on. It is a, an amazing set of prophecies regarding the end times, the times in which we find ourselves in or about to face. Can we just go back to the second uh, psalm, which is equally thrilling and uh, all about the second coming? The question is rhetoric. Uh, from the heart and mind and mouth of God, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one, that's Christ. Let us break their chains. That's where we're at today. We're in a place of universal rebellion where the things of God the principles of God, the morality of God, the word of God is refuted, rejected, and uh, we are in rebellion to it as the nations of the world. Let us break their chains, they say. Throw off their fetters. All the latter legislation that has been brought into Western civilization has largely been a totally rebellious refutation of the morality of God and the principles that God laid down for the safety and the welfare of mankind. The one, the psalmist goes on to say in verse 4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Have you ever thought of the laugh of God? There is the laugh of his pleasure and there is the laugh of his scorn. Now when he laughs in scorn, judgment is attached. Here we read of it. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them, then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. What happens in the calendar of God is that in the days immediately before the rapture of the church, this world will become darker than it's ever been spiritually, morally, and in every other way. It will become darkness. Isaiah says gross darkness has covered the earth. Then the rapture will take place. And then the one who sits enthroned in heaven will laugh in scorn at those nations that have been so militantly opposed to anything that God wants and God says and God uh, decrees and he will rebuke them in anger and terrify them in his wrath. Then, after a period of intense darkness and judgment, the Bible says... He has installed his king in Zion on his holy hill. Mm. Amazing. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. At this second coming of Christ, 
he will set up his righteous kingdom for 1,000 years, according to Isaiah chapter 11. And so the admonition is to the kings of the kingdoms. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the law, Lord, rather. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Have you ever read that psalm before? In the light of the present day, the soon coming days, and eternity? Have you read that psalm in light of the second coming? <clears throat> That's what it is. A second coming sign. And a second coming psalm. All right, the three kingdoms. The three kingdoms are in perpetually, a perpetual and eternal confrontation and will ultimately clash. They will come together. They are already contrary to one another. Just as the flesh lusts against the spirit because they are contrary to one another, the kingdoms of this world the kingdom of darkness is opposed to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Lord Christ. The kingdom of God is the one that will ultimately win. Now, the teaching of the existing chaos that we are in at this time and the future conflict and chaos and clash of the kingdoms has been neglected by so many preachers today. And I think the reason is because over the years there's been controversy, there's been confusion, and there's been extremes in teaching. And I do find that we are so reactive in the ministry that if something is a, a little bit extreme or people have run away in excess over a doctrine, we pull right back and we do what is commonly called we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, in other words, that which is essential is disregarded because of the non-essentials and the foolishness that has undoubtedly gone on as a result of extreme teaching. Now, there are people that believe in shallow and uh, psychedelic almost uh, uh, teachings on the second coming. Well, why let that stop you digging in and finding out what God actually says? I am committed to truth. I am committed to the revelation of God. I am committed to the calendar of God. I am committed to what God is saying about this generation, about this time, and the time that's shortly to come to pass. Why? Because like David of old, in spite of his imperfections, his frailties, and his limitations, I want to serve my generation like he did. In fact, that's what's said of David in retrospect over his life, that he served his generation. And while I have breath, and while our team has breath, and while my wife has breath, we are bounded together unitedly to seeing the times and seasons and appraising them in the light of Scripture. We want to be able to declare what God is saying today and what God is demanding today, what God is warning today and what God is promising today for both the church and every individual that will turn to him in simple faith and trust. Now let's talk about the kingdoms of this world. We turn this beautiful book, this fabulous revelation of God, the book of God, John Wesley called it, to 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. Here it is. Now, the Apostle Paul said that he had a ministry that he believed God had given him. 
And he says, and we have renounced secret and shameful ways. In other words, he got rid of anything that was of no consequence to the ministry. And that's how I feel at this time. There are a lot of things we could embroil ourselves in or be entangled by. We could be caught up with all kinds of stuff, all kinds of uh, controversies, all kinds of, of philosophies, all kinds of indulgent living. But we have renounced those shameful ways because we don't want to distort the word of God. We want to understand the work of God, the word of God. On the contrary, he says, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And then he talks about the battle that's going on in the world today. He says, the God of this world, the God of this age in which the world is passing through, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, says Paul, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Now the world does not recognize Jesus as Lord. They don't recognize him at all. They recognize in some sectors of society, but a diminishing uh, place uh, and, a, and a size uh, of this world would believe that Jesus was a paragon of virtue. He was an example of goodness. Uh, but for the most part in Western society and this materialistic bent society that we live in, Jesus is of no consequence. And yet, we have to say, why is this? When that which we have built our hopes in, which is our material gain and, and uh, existence, is crumbling all around us, why, why would we not believe in him? Well, the God of this world has charmed the world. The kingdoms of this world are being charmed subtly as the serpent was able to so subtly uh, seduce Adam and Eve in the garden. And the world today, through many means and through many ways and many philosophies and many tools and many individuals of influence, is able to minimize who Jesus is. The kingdoms of this world are being blinded. Now, it's a terrible thing to be blinded. A very dear friend of ours was uh, uh, clear-sighted for many, many years, most of the years of her life. And in the uh, latter years, suddenly her eyes started to be diseased and she has now completely lost her sight. And so she's fumbling and, and, and stumbling around and has to be uh, supervised because uh, um, she could be a danger to herself. Tragic situation. Now, those that have grown up with blindness and never known anything else uh, seem to cope better than those that have had their sight taken because of a disease of one kind or another. The devil has moved in and he is termed the God of this world. Now, he seems to be able to control so much that has been said, done and desired in this earth. But let me assure you that he is not in total control or God would not then be sovereign. God is sovereign and the enemy is only allowed to do what he's allowed to do by the God who sits upon the throne that we read about in Psalm 2. Now, uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians and the second chapter, 
And this is a very telling phrase. It says here that Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now in the King James, I think it says he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the one that permeates the atmosphere of this world. This kingdom of nations, the kingdom of the world. He rules, he reigns, he seeks to infect, he seeks to uh, interject his thinking, to undermine faith, to uh, jeopardize men's souls by minimizing the power of the gospel. And we read about that time and time again. Now, when we go back to Luke's gospel, the first great temptations that are recorded, there may have been others prior to this, but this is the first major temptation of Jesus that is recorded. We read that the devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant a panorama of the kingdom's of this world with all their grandeur with all their beauty with all their multitudes of citizens he gave Jesus a panoramic view supernaturally from a high place it wasn't that he could literally see those kingdoms but in that place of isolation some have said outside of Jericho in the wilderness and I've been there on numerous occasions and on the last occasion that my wife and I were there outside of Jericho we went up to the Mount of Temptation as it's called it may be the place it may not be but as I looked at those heights and I saw little monasteries that are put up there uh, and people that inhabit them for religious purposes I shivered because I thought somewhere perhaps in those nooks and crannies, in those caves, Jesus was taken supernaturally and given a panorama of the world of nations. Not only the nations that existed then, but down through the ages until Satan's rule was vanquished and taken from him. Oh yes, that day is coming and he knows it. Revelation chapter 12 says the devil has come down with vengeance knowing that he has but a short time. Now the Bible tells us that the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instance all the kingdoms of the world and said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Very significant in modern history, let alone ancient history. Let's just take modern history. Every one of the despotic rulers in the last decades be it Hitler or Stalin, communism, Nazism, just to name two, all stemmed from a God-defying society and philosophy. All stem from there is no God and we oppose the church. And into that godless disposition, that hardened heart, that ruthless disposition, Satan gave them kingdoms. The Soviet Union boasted hundreds of millions of captive souls. Nazism was able to march through Western Europe and capture and condemn and enslave so many millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people were affected by its ruthless rule. Adolf Hitler, though brought up in the Roman Catholic Church, was never once ever a Christian nor a committed Catholic. He was godless right from the start. The grandeur of the church 
somehow enthused him and gave him an insatiable desire for splendor, glory and power. Stalin had contemplated being an orthodox priest and the grandeur, the glory, the power of the church gave him an appetite to wield power but secularly and as an atheist, not just an agnostic, an atheist. And of course he was the one that ruthlessly ruled throughout the war years and into the early 1950s and brought the Soviet Union with all its satellite uh, satellite uh, nations under the power of godless atheism. You see, the darkness that was in all of those regimes made it easy for Satan to then give them the power. He says here, he says, I have the authority, it has been given to me, and I can give that authority to anyone I want to. And he has the desire to have Jesus worship him, and therefore, in a very uh, subjective way, receive the power to rule and reign over the nations. But Jesus doesn't need Satan's power, nor his contrivance. He doesn't need his benevolence. He is going to be, through his sacrifice at the cross, through his resurrection, going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and is going to, in the cross and through the resurrection, in the ascension, vanquish Satan once and for all. Hallelujah. I'm sure I heard an echo there. The kingdoms of this world. Now, in the book of John, when Jesus was on a trial before Pontius Pilate, towards the end of that chapter, Pilate says, you go and judge him. And then they did, and they brought him back. And um, Pilate said to him, um, your people, your people have brought accusations against you. I don't share their condemnation. And he says to them, uh, what have you done that makes you so repugnant in the eyes of uh, the Jews? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is not part of the world's kingdoms. They will come to him. He came for them and they will come to him according to the scriptures. Where do we read that? Well, turn to your last uh, chapters of your Bible to Revelation chapter 11. I love this scripture. Let me read it from verse 15. Verse 15 says these words. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world. Now he doesn't say kingdoms now. He says the kingdom. It's realized as being one and the same. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And this is an echo of what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, there's his humanity and the incarnation. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. There's the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the government shall rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful. Now that word wonderful is more than the 
English language expresses. It means it's so full of wonder that it goes beyond any description or any ability to define. He is more than wonderful, as the song rightly puts it. So his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The deity of Jesus is there. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, I and my Father are one. You know, it's just a marvellous scripture. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's who he is. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightnings, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Wow! And this is on the basis of the triumphant cry The kingdoms of this world or the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. When is that transfer, when is that clash of kingdoms going to take place? Well, we haven't got a great deal of time this morning, but uh, I just want to remind you that in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, So much of that is mentioned. The Bible says, This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him, declares, Number one, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Now that's going on right now. The controversy surrounding Jerusalem as the capital of the nation of Israel. A number of nations, and according to our press releases and media coverage, including America, are bringing their embassies into Jerusalem or intending to do so. It is causing upheaval and chaos and anger and upset in all those nations. What does it say here? All those nations that are surrounding Israel or Jerusalem. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. Now the the, uh, gospel writer says these words. It says that where the body is or the carcass is, there will be the vultures or the eagles, depending on your translation. What does that mean? Well, Israel is going to appear to be a helpless carcass. And it's going to be, as it were, looking as though it's defenseless and therefore bound to be overtaken and die. And the nations are going to surround it with threats of overtaking, subduing and destroying it. But it's at that time 
that they will have been prepared through what we've called the great tribulation. They will be as refined as they can be and they will start calling upon the name of the Lord. That refinement has not yet taken place. Ezekiel chapter 36 says that prior to this great refining of fire that Malachi sees, there will be a sprinkling of pure water. That's what we're seeing today. The rise of the triumphant messianic churches and fellowship. Many, many Jewish folk are turning to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah, their Saviour and their Lord. Wonderful, wonderful what God is doing. But it's just the sprinkling. It will take the time of the great tribulation, which is a judgment on the nations of the earth and a refining process to Israel to bring them to a place where they will cry out to the Lord. And God says, I will make Jerusalem an unmovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. And then it goes on to say, I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah. I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. And then it goes on to say, a number of things I will pour out on the house of David, verse 10, chapter 12 of Zechariah. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me. You see, he is going to appear. This is the true second coming. When he comes back to the Mount of Olives, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn, that's repentance, for him as one mourns for an only child and will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great. The land will mourn each clan by itself with their wives by themselves. There will be a tremendous confrontation against Israel, in Israel, at Megiddo and on beyond Megiddo to Jerusalem and that will culminate in this huge crying out to God and then Christ will appear, Messiah, Lord, King of Kings, Lord of Lords over all the nations. Well, what do we do now? What do you think we should do? I think we might bring it to a close because I think there is enough meat there to satisfy your hunger, but also if I continue on, it might choke you to death, and I don't want that. I think we might start... Uh, next week with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness and see how they are opposed. I mean, I would love sitting here in comfort on this beautifully cool winter's day in Townsville, North Queensland, Australia. I'd love to be able to go on and talk and unfortunately I've got the stamina to do it. But I want you to be blessed and I don't want you to say to yourself, oh look, this is wonderful, but it's getting overpowering. So we'll finish now and we'll come back at our next session and we'll talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of his dear son and the kingdom of heaven, which are one and the same. And uh, they are interrelated. And we're going to talk about that, how you enter that kingdom how that kingdom prevails, the power of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom, and the king of the kingdom. That's next time, and we'll, by contrast, look at the kingdom of darkness that's ruled by the God of this world and his usurping and then his undermining and his eventual destruction and judgment in the eternal 
lake of fire, which is reserved for the devil and his angels. Wow, I like all that. So God bless you and uh, keep tuned, keep coming back, keep part of uh, the, uh, the studies, do bring your Bible, search the scriptures and jot down the scripture references. When uh, we upload this to uh, YouTube, our team will make sure that you get all the references there, but it doesn't hurt you writing them down now in the meantime, so that until it's put on YouTube, you're able to go through those scriptures and study them and certainly discuss with us through Messenger or online in any way. You can discuss with us your findings, your views, and they might be contrary to mine. So what? That's fine. And uh, we want you just to be stimulated because when you truly are activated in your heart and your mind, you'll be activated in your will as well. So on behalf of Eunice and the team here, we say God bless you to you all. And let me just pray a blessing upon you. And I pray that God will bless and use you in wonderful ways and that all of your family may be redeemed through the blood of the new covenant, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your benevolence. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your power to save, to restore, and to bring back the wanderers. Father, I pray that you will do a mighty work of restoration in the church, revival in the church, and an awakening in our land that the kingdoms of this world may begin to bow the knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. May I remind you to be with us on Sunday at 10 o'clock for the live streaming We've got some wonderful things planned and I know that you'll be blessed. So be with us next Sunday and we have uh, the Bible study on Wednesday night live streamed and then uploaded to YouTube. We want you to be part of that and you'll get the notes on YouTube as well. So God bless you. We send greetings from Australia all around the world and we pray your God's blessing on you, your loved ones, your family, your friends, your church and your nation that they may know Jesus. Amen. God bless you.